welcome to my talk. Thanks for coming. I want to talk to you about um, uh, Spark and the work we did uh, to build this uh, system for astronomical data analysis with Spark and um, some of the cool things about astronomy I, I learned along the way. So I am um, um, CTO at SV Group, a um, company of about 50 people in Zagreb, Croatia. I'm also a um, PhD student at the University of Zagreb, a computer science PhD student, and I'm collaborating with people at the University of Washington at the Direct Institute. They are the astronomers I've been, been, been working on this um, system with. I also wrote the Spark in Action book, which came out in 2016 already. It, it's been already three years. And um, um, it was, you know, f uh, wrote, written for um, Spark 2.0. Spark 3.0 is about to come out now, so it's kind of oldish. But um, I'm also providing um, Spark courses, so if you need one course for your team, uh, you can ping me. Okay, so it's a, we're, we're talking about sky, and so fascinating, it's been fascinating us humans for millennia, and it still holds all those many unanswered que questions, like how did it all start, and uh, what's it made of, and uh, what is the future of the universe, and uh, are we alone? We still don't know answers to many of these questions. We have some ideas, but we really don't know. And the, the way we've been trying to answer those questions is by just looking at the sky, of course, and we built many different contraptions called telescopes and bigger and bigger ones, and some of them really huge. And we've put some of them even into space, as you know. And they've been discovering these uh, really cool and things, and this is one of those fascinating things I've never heard before, before I started doing this. Uh, do you, do it, does anybody here know what this is? Okay, only a couple of hands, so I'm glad I can, I can tell you about this. So this is um, a strong lensing effect, which was predicted by Einstein back in the 20s. Um, this is called the Einstein ring. So what happens is that um, there's a supernova explosion somewhere be behind a supermassive galaxy and which stands between us and this supernova, right at the middle, um, um, right on the straight line between us and the supernova. So the, some of the light that would just radially uh, go in all the directions, some of it curves around this supermassive galaxy because it's so massive it bends light. And some of that light centers on the Earth and produces this um, interesting effect. So that's pretty cool. And uh, there are also cool things, and uh, um, one of the other things that I never knew about is that there's this weak lensing thing where um, actually everything that we look at, the, uh, all the images that we look from the deep sky is actually somehow bent, and the light always bends around those, those galaxies. And science, scientists have been trying to map how this light goes around the uh, mass um, throughout the, the universe. And to do that, they, they try to correlate how, um, uh, how uh, bent these images of neighboring galaxies are, to, to try to correlate them and then um, try to find those clumps of mass. And um, to, to do that, they need the really precise measurements and uh, really good pictures, and um, that's where LSST comes in, and that's uh, this new a uh, big telescope being built in uh, Cerro, on Cerro Pachon in Chile. Uh, it stands for Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. A really big, huge project. It is both wide and deep. Uh, telescopes are usually either wide, meaning that they cover large uh, regions of the sky, or deep, meaning that they, they can capture really the faintest objects in the sky. So it's really rare that one telescope can do both, uh, uh, go wide and deep at the same time. So um, it, it will have house the largest camera in the world once it's complete. It will continuously observe the night sky during 10 years and produce the first video of the universe in history because um, it will e every two and a half nights it will cover the whole sky and do that for 10 years. 
So that will produce uh, uh, about seven to 800 images of each uh, region of the sky uh, on average. Um, and it will, it will start the full science operations 2023. So the goals of the, this project is to answer those questions uh, about dark matter and dark energy. We don't know what, they, what those are. We know that there's some matter that we cannot see, so it's called dark matter, because some, some of the galaxies that are um, clusters of galaxies are held together. And um, if there was no other uh, matter but that, we, that which we can see, those galaxies are likely to would just fall apart. So there's something holding them together, and we don't know what that is. So they're calling it dark matter. And there's also dark energy, uh, this presumable force that's driving the um, expansion of the universe. Uh, the universe has been expanding, right? And we don't know why. So that's first goal. Second is to make the catalog of um, solar system objects, including the potentially dangerous asteroids, because NASA, um, American Congress, gave NASA, NASA the um, a mandate to find 80% of potentially Earth-threatening asteroids by 2020-something. So that's uh, the second goal. The, the third goal is to track transients, and those are all the... Uh, when you take two pictures of the same region of the sky, and all the differences between those two, two pictures if something moves, something disappears, or something uh, appears on the second one, that's the uh, a transient. So uh, LSST pipeline will produce alerts to the scientific community w uh, in 60 seconds from uh, detection of any such transients. There can be millions of them during one night. And uh, w uh, the final goal is to study structure and formation of, of our galaxy. So just to give you an idea of how expensive this whole project is, this is the building. Uh, it's almost complete now on top of this um, uh, hill in Chile. And um, the telescope itself has 350 tons. So this is the image of the telescope. And the mirror, um, this unique design of the mirror, it, it has uh, both the primary and tertiary mirror on the same, uh, on the same mirror. So the outer, um, outer part of this mirror is the primary, and the dent in the middle is a tertiary mirror, and the secondary mirror is above in the, in the, uh, in the air, suspended. So th that gives the LSST ability to go both wide and deep. And the camera is the uh, largest camera in the world. It will have 3.2 gigapixel images, which uh, translates to 6.4 gigabytes. And if you want to uh, show just one of those images in, f uh, in real resolution, you would need th 1,500 uh, high-definition TVs, which uh, sounds like, you know, um, impressive. And it will take a new image every 20 seconds every night, so for, t for 10 years. So in numbers, that would be the total of about 80, maybe 90 petabytes, which is not that huge compared to some of the companies today, but uh, still it's... Um, a uh, considerable amount of uh, data, and um, especially for astronomy. And uh, it, will, it will have that uh, real-time streaming uh, aspect to it with the alerts, and there will be uh, what nightly alert, 10 millions of nightly alerts going to the, out to the scientific community. And all of this data will be stored in a queryable catalog. So that's where we are now coming to the uh, subject of the talk, because each of these telescopes, they produce this um, database of uh, measurements of each of little points in the sky, uh, sky whether it be asteroids, a star, or a um, galaxy. That all goes in a big uh, astronomical catalog. So each uh, row can be detections. You have many columns, uh, different kinds of measurements, um, uh, with different filters and so on. And uh, typically each, uh, each of these uh, projects, astronomical project, has, has their own um, image processing pipeline, which is really not a trivial thing. There's uh, many things for this uh, piece of software to solve, or pieces of software. Uh, you have to estimate the background on, Im on each image. That's really important to, 
to 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 uh, have accurate and precise measurements of uh, to be able to compare to previous measurements. Then the PSF uh, estimation. PSF is the point spread function, uh, 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 an image or a blurb uh, of light that. Uh, one, one, just one um, point source of light makes on the um, focal plane of the that you get on the image. So it depends on the moment, it depends on the atmosphere, it depends on the uh, position on the telescope, where the telescope is heading, and and, and so on. And um, then you have to detect all those objects on the, in the image. Sometimes they are not detectable on one image. Uh, you don't see them on one image, then you have to co-add several images to for, for them to appear. Then, for example, deep blending, where many stars, there are those uh, crowded stellar uh, fields, where there are many, many uh, stars on the same, um, really close to each other, so you have to separate light coming from many of them. So that's called deep blending, and those are all really complicated problems. So once that's done, you have a this catalog with measurements which are uh, good as your processing pipeline is. And that's when actually the astronomers start to ask um, questions. And they usually do this with the some kind of SQL interface. For example, uh, SDSS project um, has this open, you can, everybody can access this uh, online. And you can um, issue queries, just SQL queries. And uh, obtain some kind of results, you download that locally, and they would typically um, analyze this usu usually with Python. Astronomers mostly just know Python. If you mention anything else, uh, they don't want to talk to you. And um, so they produce these kinds of, you know, some scientific results from this. And, uh, but this traditional approach doesn't really scale well. LSST project will provide the science platform and they will use Jupyter Notebooks and other tools. However, still, you would want to, they, they often want to combine multiple catalogs from LSST and Gaia mission and some other missions and combine all of the measurements from, from all of these because some of them have you know, different approaches and they can uh, really um, get new insights into data from when they combine the data from all of them. And they often want to work on the full data sets. So they want to test their theories on billions of objects at the same time on the whole sky. So that's where this um, access system we, that we built um, with, uh, with the folks, astronomers at the Dirac Institute in University of Washington. Uh, that stands for Astronomy Extensions for Spark. So they saw this need for new generation astronomical analysis tool that would be efficient in this cross-matching when you need to combine multiple catalogs. You have billions and billions of stars in both and uh, you need to efficient do that efficiently and potentially on the fly. Then uh, that's based on industry standards like uh, Apache Spark so that you don't have to um, do your custom-made code and then maintain it and uh, solve already solved problems. And uh, that would provide simple but powerful astronomical API extensions and to be, use, uh, to, to be easy to use on premises or, or in the cloud. Uh, the goal is to just spin it up somewhere in the, on Amazon or somewhere else, uh, do your analysis on the data that's already there and then, um, then publish the results. Uh, the access history was this system of a rather unfortunate name, LSD, by Mario Juric from uh, the Direct Institute. He's professor at, of astronomy there at the University of Washington. And um, that was a tool for querying, and still is, still used, tool for querying cross-matching analysis of positional and temporally indexed data sets. So it's not just for astronomy, it can be used for other also data sets, but uh, mostly used by astronomers. It was inspired and uh, started, uh, inspired by Google's Big Table Map Reduce papers, similarly to Hadoop, and started about at the same time. So it was kind of, you know, uh, uh, ahead of its time. Um, but today it, um, it has this fixed data partitioning, which introduces a significant data skew. 
and also um, it partitions the data based on time. So, however, astronomers don't, um, they, most of their queries span the whole um, so-called light curves when you have uh, many measurements for each, uh, for one object in many uh, moments, that's called the light curve. So they often want, most often want to, um, to analyze the whole light curve at the same time and not partition slice by time. And uh, it is not resilient to worker failures uh, in, in a way that, for example, Spark is. And also contains lot of, lots of custom solutions, as, as I said. It's not industry-based, it's not um, 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 backed by big community, and so on. A and also it needs to be ported to sp uh, Python 3.0. And uh, when you get all of this together, it uh, makes much more sense to build a new new system. So, uh, first of all, let me explain what this cross-matching thing is. Uh, when we have um, uh, DEC and RA coordinates, those are RA's right ascension, meaning going from 0 to 360, that way um, telescope um, rota rotates, and DEC is declination, going from minus 90 to 90. So that's the uh, coordinate system. And then you, we put two um, uh, detections from two catalogs on, th on the same uh, image, for example. Uh, we denote one of, one of those catalogs with uh, dots and the other with the crosses. And the circles are the search uh, radius that we would like to, to search. So uh, we would like to s find all the matches from the second catalog uh, that are within uh, some distance from all the rows from the first catalog. So if you have billions and billions of um, um, rows in both tables, that's uh, you know not not a trivial thing. It's not not so complicated to understand what's the um, task, but it's it's not trivial when it's you know big data. So the way we solve this is um, uh, by basically by data partitioning. That's the uh, fundamental thing that makes it fast in access. Uh, we based it on um, late Jim Gray's zones algorithm. He was uh, part of Microsoft Research, and they built, um, they came up with the um, a set of uh, in indexing method and SQL queries to make um, make this fast on SQL uh, Microsoft SQL Server. So we took this idea, but just adapted it for for the distributed architectures. And they, they divided the sky into horizontal zones of, of a certain height. And um, that's the basic partitioning scheme of the data. Uh, so in our distributed version, we store data in parquet files, which is um, arguably the, the most often used um, format along with the Spark or maybe even in big data world. Uh, and we bucket those files by zones. Buckets are just uh, physical files. So when when you have many buckets uh, forming a single parquet file, Spark can read all of those buckets and treat it as a single single uh, file or table. And we bucket by zone, meaning that all the rows that uh, belong to the same um, zone, that stripe of sky, they go into the same uh, physical uh, file. And we sort those files by zone because many zones can go into same f into the same file because we don't have we have uh, more zones than than files. We sort those files by zone and RA columns. And uh, we also uh, take a, sh a narrow strip on the lower border of each zone and duplicate those all of those rows to the zone below, so that when we try to find um, the um, objects that are spanning the border in the neighbor uh, neighborhood of each point, uh, there could be some of them that span the going that are found in the uh, neighboring zone. So, in, uh, in order for for us to be able just to use data from a single file and not not require any data shuffling inside the cluster, we duplicate the data parts of the data to uh, into different files. 
So uh, this is just an example with four buckets and 16 zones. So this is what I've been talking about. If, if we have um, all the objects from zone one and five and nine will go to bucket one and from zone two and uh, zone six to bucket two and so on. So when we try to then join two tables, like <coughs> when the data is partitioned like this, then Spark will, will be able to do this uh, independently and in parallel uh, for each pair of buckets from the two tables. And so if we have only four executors like shown here, and we have two catalogs or parquet files or tables, uh, each bucketed in the same way with the same number of zones, then each executor can take uh, one corresponding pair of files, buckets, and join them, read them, join them independently of the others. If you had uh, much more buckets and uh, a smaller number of executors, then you would do that repeatedly several times in iterations. And um, it would take more time, but uh, so it's scalable. As much uh, executors you give it, it can uh, do more in parallel, right? Um, and this is the, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Spark, but Spark has this web UI and part of it is uh, Spark SQL UI, where you can see for each of your queries, you can see the uh, physical, uh, logical and physical optimized plan for each, for each of the queries. So what this says here, you have um, two columns uh, corresponding to each file, and it just says I will scan the parquet file, filter some of the um, rows based on some conditions, and then do a sort that's mandatory be before the sort merge join. And um, um, this sort does, does nothing actually because the data is already sorted. So we have two files, all both are read at this, uh, a, a, in the same way, and then they are directly brought to the join uh, step. If you had a separate uh, box saying exchange, that would mean that uh, Spark would need to shuffle the data around the cluster. So that's something you want to uh, avoid in Spark. Uh, you don't want shuffling data if you don't need to. And in this case, you really don't need to. And um, this is the ideal sol situation you want. So this is um, really par paralyzable and real fast. However, there's one more detail and one more problem uh, with Spark because uh, when you have a query like such as this one, um, select from two tables where we join by zone. There's, that's an equi join on the zone column. And uh, then we also have uh, that RA co uh, coordinate is between some range of the RA coordinates from the second um, uh, table. Then what Spark actually does is uh, it takes all the rows from corresponding zones from the same zones, two zones, and we have uh, many, many objects in belonging to the same zone because they sp span the whole sky horizontally. So what, what Spark does is it, it does the um, a Cartesian join, each row by, by each row. So that's a huge amount of uh, pairs. And only then does it try to um, uh, filter them out based on the sec second uh, condition here, this between condition. Uh, so we implemented this, uh, what's actually sometimes called epsilon join, or variation of this epsilon join, and we filed this uh, Spark um, a Jira ticket with this change, and uh, we hope that it will be merged into Spark soon. Uh, so we called it sort merge join inner range optimization. But what it does is it just maintains a moving window over the rows from on the on the uh, second table as as the rows from the first table um, change. So it just checks if the for each uh, row in the second table if it should be uh, removed from the window or should the next row be added to it. And in that way, it can uh, it uses the minimum amount of memory required and uh, the minimum amount of um, 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 comparisons that are needed. So it's really efficient and it just zips by both, both tables, data from both tables. 
Uh, other approaches that have been used traditionally is um, hill picks for par partitioning uh, sky into um, how to partition sky and index the, the sky have been uh, hill picks and uh, HTM, hierarchical or triangular mesh. They are both um, able to dynamically um, uh, partition the data on the, uh, you can specify the level of granularity that, that you want uh, on in the runtime on the fly. So you can specify, uh, you know, how long, how large those um, uh, areas you want, you want. And it's good if you want to describe some complex, uh, complex shapes and or um, overlappings of those complex shapes. Uh, however, for cross-matching and most of the operations that are actually done for astronomical uh, data, um, there we believe at least that it's uh, much slower than zones algorithm. So we have some uh, um, um, performance results and data for in the, in the paper. So this is from from our paper. Uh, so we took Gaia um, uh, catalog. That's the European um, telescope that's in in, uh, in space, I guess you know, uh, which has 1.7 billion objects, and SDSS, which has 800 million, and then also ZTF with 3 billion objects, and we try to uh, cross match those, and we also um, it was all done on a single large machine with about uh, half a terabyte of uh, memory. But there was still there was no way that all of that data can fit in uh, in that um, memory on the single machine. So we part of the data was um, we we uh, did two variations of the test with warm cache and cold cache. Cold cache meaning that the cache was empty at the beginning. We didn't use Spark caching because there's no way that we can cache that in Spark's memory. Uh, we used the Linux system file system cache. So we emptied the cache at the beginning, so that's cold. And then it would read and fill it out that cache uh, while it was running. And the second uh, version of the test is uh, warm cache when it was already partially filled. So these are the results and we can do this, um, for example, Gaia almost 2 billion with 3 billion in ZTF uh, with warm cache, that's 40 seconds. That's uh, only cross-matching, not, nothing additional, no additional computation, just the cr uh, cross-match. And uh, 315 seconds with the cold cache. So Access API, um, you use it just as you would use uh, Spark, and you get some additional uh, methods with, uh, on the, these access frames. Um, so you have to first in initialize the access catalog, and you give it an instance of Spark session, because Access Catalog will look at the Spark's um, um, uh, Metastore database, which holds the data about the tables it knows about. And it adds additional metadata about, about those tables, such as zone height and number of buckets and, and so on. And then you can use it to load catalogs that you have in your uh, met, uh, Metastore. So here, for example, um, I'm reading SDSS catalog and Gaia catalog, and that gives you a Spark data frame, but also that's also a class of access frame. Um, so you have additional methods such as crossmatch, and then crossmatch also gives you just another uh, access frame, which is again a, a Spark frame, and then you can do additional stuff you would do with uh, with normal Spark programs and uh, other you know, filtering and maybe machine learning or whatnot. Uh, from other functional functionalities, we have two versions of the crossmatch and uh, we have region queries. You can uh, you know, uh, uh, give it two points in the sky and it will return all the objects between um, a square um, defined by those points. Or cone queries, you give it a one point and the radius, so it gives you all the um, objects there. Uh, histogram and 2D histogram, where you give it a uh, number of bins, it will return number of objects in um, each of the bins based on some conditions, condition or two conditions in 2D version. Um, 
So you can use array functions if you have light curve data. So many um, many measurements for one single object, you can put it put that in an, an array column, and then use Spark array functions to to analyze that. And of course, other Spark functions, uh, even streaming or machine learning graphics or. So the next steps is uh, are to uh, make access cloud ready to have uh, at least uh, actually this is already been used this way in uh, direct institute in uh, Seattle uh, so they uh, they put some of the those catalogs pre-partitioned in s3 buckets and um, you can spin up access on kubernetes on demand you do your analysis and uh, bring it down bring it down once you're done and um, we hope to empower new astronomical discoveries, discoveries in the 21st century. So, uh, again, if you need a Spark course, you can ping me. There's my email address. And uh, you can check out the uh, documentation and the source code. It's all open source uh, of access if you're interested. And if you have any questions, I'm, I'm here. Or if not, then thank you. <laughs>